yesterday after a string of PowerPoint presentations and a panel, my friend Robert Spellman over there looked at me and said, is all this information influencing the way you're thinking of giving your presentation tomorrow? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> it's a lot of information. Um, so, you know, I was thinking, actually, when after we started to talk about this a little bit, and I almost decided to renege on my topic, like Ken uh, McLeod did yesterday. <laughs> and it happened many, many times, a hundred times maybe yesterday. And it started with Ken's presentation, where in the last maybe 30 seconds, I think I heard him say the word awe. <laughs> and I thought, wouldn't that be amazing um, to hear someone speak about awe or amazement, which I actually think is a very points to something very um, particular about this tradition and this practice. Um, the Buddha himself said that those who are awake live in a constant state of amazement. It's one of my favorite quotes, although I don't exactly know what sutra that comes from, so I'm a little suspicious still. If any of you know, maybe you can tell me. Um, but I think Martine was saying, actually, in her presentation, you know, it's kind of a, we need to, she wanted to bring this sense of awe down to earth. But I actually think it's a very earthy topic. And it has a lot to do with the way we are in the world and we, the way we relate to others. And I felt like, well, maybe that's what I should talk about. You know, the open question. This is kind of my thing anyways. Um, but then after the panel, I felt during the panel, we were kind of flirting with this idea of the teacher. Um, and that is a very provocative topic, I think, for everyone. It's challenging, and it's messy, and it's um, touching and poignant, um, and very difficult, especially in the West. So I thought, oh, why don't I just forget this whole thing I have planned, all these slides that I have um, organized, and just sit here or stand here and just talk about my experience with my teacher. I thought that would be great. <laughs> um, so it's interesting because, you know, when we, when we move about in relationship, you know, we're all in relationship. It's like merging systems. I felt that yesterday. It's like I was being continuously uh, changed by all the relationship I was experiencing. I mean, it wasn't any different yesterday, but it was a little bit more uh, mental stimulus that I'm used to. I live up at 9,000 feet in the mountains, and it's very quiet. <laughs> so I was challenged by this. And it's interesting. I, I work with horses. And when you put a new horse into a, a new pasture, uh, they have to reorganize. And they have to they merge syst this systems merging again. And they figure it out very quickly. Uh, there's a pecking order, um, and it's very sane and very clear and very simple. Uh, for us, it's, it's much more complicated if you think of your own personal relationships, uh, what it's like to merge systems. <laughs> it, it can be very complicated, and I think part of it is because we hold on so tightly um, to who we think we are and our beliefs and so on. Um, I really appreciated Martine's presenta presentation yesterday because uh, she was talking about grasping and how when you're grasping onto something or you become contracted, you know, your creativity is not released. You know, it's through openness or through our ability to move out of contraction and into relationship that we actually can respond uh, to the world in a sane and very clear, uh, very creative way. And it's interesting because we talk a lot about no self in this tradition, which is a very uh, challenging topic. But in a way, it's about moving out of a contraction of belief, who you think you are, who you want to be, who you shouldn't be, who somebody else is, and just uh, move, out, move out into, into the world, and, res and it allows you to respond. So it's the contraction um, that's very difficult for us. But anyways, I woke up this morning, and I decided that I wanted to go back to my original uh, topic. But it actually has something to do with this idea of responsiveness um, and being in the world and not contracting. Um, and the topic is resting in the heart of, of the human predicament. Um, and I feel this has actually a lot to do with lineage for me. Um, I think about lineage a lot in the future of this lineage, as Surya Das says, is now constantly. 
um, because my lineage is very important to me, in fact. Um, and how do we bring the wisdom of this particular lineage forward? Um, and I think the question that arises for me is, what actually is it that we want to bring forward? You know, what are we talking about here? And I think when I look at what is really essential to this lineage, it has something to do with practice. Um, and practice, to me, has to do with finding our resting place, finding a sane relationship in our world, you know, how to be in the world in relationship. Um, so when I say resting place, though, I don't mean sitting on a cushion. Um, resting place, to me, um, has much more to do with finding this place of practice. Um, so what is genuine practice? You know, this is what I want to talk about this morning. And there's so many ways to talk about this. Um, so I've just, you know, kind of uh, contemplated this for this particular occasion and um, responded to that. So I'm just going to um, do a slide presentation now um, on this. So as we've been talking um, the past two days, it seems like a week, a month, <laughs> somehow, to me, um, things have really changed. Things are changing rapidly in the world. And um, if you look at the world in the last two and a half, two, two and a half thousand years, um, it, things have changed dramatically. But when we look at the human condition in the most essential way, nothing has actually changed. Uh, in our world from the time of the Buddha. We're still, we're still searching for lasting happiness. We're still grappling with old age, sickness, and death. And we continue to live with uncertainty and change. And our world continues to surprise us. As we encounter beauty and suffering and destruction and creativity, um, kindness and aggression. And this is a photo of the World Trade Center um, taken a couple days after 9-11. Um, the photographer is Joel Meyerowitz. Um, and I was looking for a slide that would capture all these different kinds of experiences, suffering and beauty and so on. And I thought, oh, maybe I should just do a little collage with many different kinds of uh, scenarios or experiences. But when I saw this, I, I, I see so much in this picture. Um, first of all, the destruction is very obvious. Um, and the aggression, we can infer. We know what happened here. Um, I think the uh, creativity you can see in the architecture of the building. Um, when you go to New York City and you look at these buildings, you feel so amazed. How did this happen, you know? There's so much creativity um, we see around us. And then the beauty, well, there are people in there, you know? and the kindness of the people who risk their lives to help others. And there's a lot of, there's a strong sense of power in this picture, and also vulnerability. There's so much. You know, usually we look at something and we kind of objectify it immediately, and we don't really spend the time to see that life is quite full. So I felt that this picture captured this poignancy, this sense of fullness, um, of life, that life is not just, it's not just one way. So amid all this fullness that we call life, um, we continue to search for definitive answers to human problems. So we look for, you know, the perfect technology or the perfect uh, solution to the, for the perfect economy or the perfect diet, or the perfect relationship. And yet, history has revealed to us that there has never been a definitive answer to any of these questions. Life doesn't lend itself to being known in a static way. It just continues to show us that nothing is certain. So the truth of uncertainty is actually acknowledged even in the realm of science. As a theoretical physicist, uh, David Peet, he was a student of David Bohm, who was a colleague of Einstein or a student of Einstein, he said, it is widely understood in the realm of science 
that certainty is a failed historical enterprise. That we live in uncertainty doesn't mean that the world is broken. It's just that life by nature is dynamic, it's expressive, and full of vitality. It's open to interpretation, and we never know what's next. Everything is always a work in progress, and so the data is never all in. So this poignant truth challenges us as we try to understand our humanness. It presents us with a predicament. How do we respond to and live in a world that is not solvable? This is what the Buddha asked. And his path is a poignant, challenging, and beautiful exploration of this very question. So one way we ordinarily respond to the human predicament is we try to fix the unfixable world of things. Now, if you look up the word fix in the dictionary, it says to place securely or to make stable or firm. So in essence, when we aim to fix, we want to bring something to a static or a lasting state. Our longing to fix can be motivated by the best of intentions, for instance, to bring the world to a lasting state of peaceful equilibrium. Many beautiful and courageous things have taken place in the world through understanding that there's no better way to utilize our lives than to respond to suffering with all our might. As the Dalai Lama says, you know, we humans are social beings. We come into the world as a result of others' actions. We survive here in dependence upon others. Whether we like it or not, there's hardly a moment of our lives in which we do not benefit from others' activities. For this reason, it is hardly surprising that most of our happiness arises in the context of our relationship with others, nor is it so remarkable that our greatest joy should come when we are motivated by concern for others. So this is the truth of our experience, and yet the human condition continues. When we look at the path of dharma, we see that what we often call evolution does not come from fixing the world. Usually we see evolution in a linear way, but in a world that is dynamic and expressive, there is no linear progress. This is why the human condition is described as a circle, traditionally known as samsara. Let me explain. So there's this classical story from the sutras about Gotami and the mustard seed. You might have heard this story before. So in the story, Gotami comes to the Buddha clutching the dead body of her infant in her arms, and she pleads to the Buddha, please bring him back to me. Please do something. Fix this. And the Buddha is very touched by by her grief, and he promises that he will do something, but she has to do something first. She has to go to every home in the village that she lives in and collect a single mustard seed from anyone who has not known someone who has died. So she sets out, and of course she comes back empty-handed because everyone has experienced loss. But in the process of looking for this mustard seed, she moves from I am suffering to there is suffering. The Buddha's message is clear that there is no cure for old age, sickness, and death, that the human condition cannot be fixed. But Gotami, in the process of looking, had a liberation. She was touched by the human condition, and through admitting the truth of unfixability into her awareness, she could heal, awaken. Another way we respond to the human predicament is we get overwhelmed. I think we all know this when we turn on the news and we're hit with this sense of heaviness and depression. There's so much suffering. How do we bear it? And so we move from belief to doubt. Um, And we suddenly realize we can't fix life after all and we feel extremely ineffective. 
It's as if life is happening to us, like we're too small for our own life. Trying to fix or getting overwhelmed by life are two ways we turn away from the human predicament. But Gotami's liberation suggests another way. It suggests that when we let life touch us, we can directly engage our world. In other words, it is through relationship that we move out of a contracted sense of self. The genius of this approach is that we don't have to get rid of the ego at all. In fact, all we have to do is make our ego big enough to include others and make them the recipient of the love and care we feel for ourselves. In the eighth chapter of Shanti Deva's Bodhisattva Charya Avatara, which is uh, the way of the Bodhisattva, he says, just as hands and other limbs are thought of as members of a body, can we likewise not consider others as the limbs and members of a whole? So what he's essentially saying is, make the world your body. So Gunkar Jatso's uh, drawing here illustrates to me, it reminds me, that life is not too scary, complex, or beautiful for us. We're big enough for our life. And it is only through our ability to include life that we can respond to the world without fear and desperation. So I wanted to talk about this today uh, to remind us all to remember the importance of living in the heart of the human predicament. My personal concern as I join this greater discussion of Dharma in these times is that we get excited and we start to talk about how we think Buddhism should look. And we forget to come back to the basic challenge that hasn't really changed since the time of the Buddha. What is, it, what is it about the way we as Buddhists respond to the world that is unique and wakeful? How is this path different from the usual ways we respond to suffering, both fixing and overwhelm? And finally, how do we respond to an unfixable world? Thank you.